Pennsylvania has a long tradition of manufacturing centers. They called them ironworks, places where people came together to build things. This podcast is about building and sustaining our democracy. We call it Democracy Works. From the, uh, from the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at uh, Penn State University, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Chris Beam, and this is Democracy Works. And uh, Michael, we're going to talk today about uh, polarization. Mm-hmm. And there is nobody, I don't think, who would dispute the idea that ours is a very polarized politics and culture. But it would be useful for us to just take a step back and talk about what does that mean what it, and and what are the implications of that for democracy so so michael what does it mean what does polarization mean right so this is a term we hear a lot about and it's not always clear to me that it's being used quite properly it's useful when thinking about polarization to kind of divide the political world into two distinct groups and that is elites you know elected officials mm-hmm. and the public uh, and, and often polarization is used to apply to one, to apply to the other, to apply to both. And it's, it's useful to kind of to, to sort that out a little bit. There's no doubt in this country that political elites have become highly polarized. Now, what that means is that the Democratic and Republican Party have become much more ideologically distinct mm-hmm. from one another. But it's also important to note, and uh, commentators often don't like to acknowledge this, that polarization is what we call asymmetrical. And what asymmetrical polarization refers to is that the fact that the Republican Party elites have become far more conservative over time than Democratic elites have become liberal Mm -hmm, over time. mm -hmm. Uh, The consequence of that is polarization. You have a situation where the parties are further apart than arguably any time before, maybe other than the Civil War, and uh, that this has important consequences for our politics. Now, I distinguish between that and polarization in the public, which is a kind of different different thing. And right. that is to say that the public is not really as polarized over issues as elites are, where a Democratic and Republican office holder have distinct views. Uh, but they have become very polarized effectively, which is to say that increasingly Democrats don't like Republicans, Republicans don't like Democrats, and this sort of tribalism mm-hmm. and uh, has occurred. It, it has been a, a source of a lot of the gridlock mm-hmm. that we've talked about. Uh, you know, the, we're in a kind of weird time right now where you've got one party control, but the president is, you know, the Republican Party is becoming more like Donald Trump. And the fact that you have, you know, party leaders now who are aware of this polarization are really feel like their own futures are. You know, that their responsibility is, in effect, to cater to the more extreme wings of their party creates a lot of problems. And that's where within the competition the is yeah. in a lot of the districts or even in states, right? It's not at the uh, at the general election. It's in the primary. Right. So today we're going to talk with uh, an expert on polarization in the states. Uh, Boris is an assistant professor at the University of Houston. And, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say he's the foremost scholar in the country on polarization in the states. Uh, uh, he's created some uh, some uh, measures of polarization that are widely used in a lot of state politics research. And it'd be interesting to hear what he has to say about that. All right. Well, let's bring on Jenna and Boris. Boris, thank you for joining us today on Democracy Works. Thank you very much. So uh, we're going to be talking today all about political polarization and uh, how that implicates democracy or its, its, its effects on democracy. And before we get to that, though, I think polarization is a term that's been thrown around a lot, uh, particularly since 2016. And I think you was perhaps no better person to help kind of put some definition around polarization and, you know, what what exactly it, it means. So if you could maybe start there. That'd yeah, be sure. I think the... The first thing we should think about when we think about polarization is a kind of a ideological separation uh, between two sides. Okay, so that could mean different things at different levels. So sometimes we talk about polarization when we mean the public, like public opinion, and we think about uh, that Democrats are becoming more liberal and Republicans are becoming more conservative in terms of the public. Um, Or we could think about that in terms of you know, politicians in legislatures or in Congress becoming uh, partisans, becoming more liberal conservative. So 
And so that what does that mean, becoming more liberal or conservative? That could mean that the sort of the divisions of opinion within a grouping, like typically a party, are decreasing. So it used to be the case that we had moderate or even liberal pro-choice Republicans and super pro-life uh, conservative Republicans. And nowadays, that the moderate end has fallen off. And similarly, we used to have moderate, even conservative Democrats, uh, some even pro-life, and that has fallen away. So the division, uh, the, the internal division of opinion goes down when you have polarization, but also their second aspect of it is that the two sides pull apart. Okay, so both of those things are, are what we mean when we talk about polarization, either at the you know, the public opinion level or at the legislative level. Right. And so is that pulling apart happening at both of those levels, both in in, in public opinion and in, in the uh, legislative arena? So in the legislative arena, for sure it's happening. Um, and it, it, it's, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, that is a decades-long process, both in Congress and the state legislatures. Uh, in public opinion, it's much more controversial whether it's happening or not. I think the best evidence suggests there may be a little bit of it happening, um, and what the, 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 the other phenomena that's happening at the public opinion level is that people are just much better sorted into the party. So if you were a conservative in the past, uh, you could find yourself in a Democratic Party or as an independent or a Republican. And now you're just much more likely to be in the Republican Party and vice versa for liberals. Uh, so that we have that sorting process. And the other aspect of it is kind of affective uh, partisanship or polarization that you sort of like – are disliking the other side much more, and you're getting your all, all angry and upset about the other side. So that that probably is also a little bit increasing. But overall, a lot of the, most of the polarization that we're talking about is happening at the elite levels. Right. And so, what does that mean for democracy when these two sides are you know becoming increasingly polarized? Right. So we're worried because um, our our system of government uh, has a lot of veto points. Has a lot of areas where you could stop progress on. Uh, lawmaking and policy making, and uh, the more polarization you have, the more uh, uh, incentive there are for individual uh, political actors to sort of stop the proceedings if they are disagreeing with. But it doesn't have to be, and it could be small number of people that are stopped the proceedings. So we have often seen, um, say, the uh, the Freedom Caucus and the Republican Party in Congress, uh, who are um, you know. Uh, a, a, a minority grouping within their own party, but who wield disproportionate power because of the institutional setup of Congress privileges small minorities to do this. And when polarization is great, you're going to get these um, small groupings that are that wield disproportionate power. So that's what we're kind of worried about um, with with polarization as far as far as that's concerned. Now, I will say though, at the state level, as opposed to Congress, there it's a little bit different. Uh, there's fewer veto points. Um, and also, in Congress, the parties are competitive. Um, and, and we, of course, the most important thing is we have these supermajority requirements like uh, filibuster and things like that. So that gives even more power to, mi to minorities, minorities that might be ideologically extreme. At so the state level, we have less supermajority requirements. And a lot of states are single-party states. So polarization kind of means something different at the state level. So if you're, if you're a progressive... You kind of like polarization in California because it's a one party dominated control and they're like really progressive and they're doing progressive things. And vice versa, if you're a conservative, you kind of like polarization in Texas because it's the state is giving you what you want. Um, and so that's a different perspective of polarization than people in Congress who are more worried about things just. Just, just totally turning into gridlock up there. Right, and uh, you know, I think too, we're, we've been talking a lot at this conference here about the the kind of rise of women in legislature and these women's groups, and it, and it right. seems like maybe that could contribute to some things when you have all these women coming in fueled by organizations that are, you know, advocating one ideology right, or another. Right, right. right. So like I mean, that. the the uh, you know, one thing I didn't appreciate till I, uh, till I saw that paper was, um, you know, how. You know, ideological the groups were that were recruiting uh, these women candidates, and um, that's probably leading to kind of this disjuncture between uh, between Republican women, Republican Democratic women, but um, they're really putting the emphasis uh, on recruiting progressive uh, progressive candidates. Um, so, uh, you know, um, it's also the case that if you look at public opinion, women are slightly more liberal than Republicans, but the difference is is relatively minor. 
of course, we're talking about when we're talking about people who are recruited to run for office, we're talking about the extremes, right? So these are not people just plucked from the population. These are right people who are activists and they're right. They're going to be an extreme on yeah. one side or All another. Groups. Right. Right. So. Right. Um, so you mentioned uh, California earlier. Yeah. I know that they, they've kind of tried to make some changes to the way that they do their their primaries. Right. Um, was, was that in, in an effort to curb polarization? Yeah, that was explicitly one of the uh, one of the motivations. So uh, one of the chief organizers, and along with Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, in their in their kind of public sell job on the, on these initiatives, they said, "Look, we're moderates, and we don't we don't have a home." Here uh, and one of my one of my favorite uh, pictures is Arnold Schwarzenegger holding up a a, a, a a plot from my one of my papers and saying, "Here's California and how this is how much of an outlier we are and and I'm the only one that's that's kind of uh, I'm the only one that, that makes sense in this state." <laughs> it was very funny, but but uh, so that was the, that was the idea. And in, in the top two primer system, which is what they adopted, the idea was that unlike the traditional system where where the primaries are run uh, separately for the parties. And so what often happens or what we fear happens is that only the party stalwarts or the zealots come out and vote. And then two extremists elect two extreme general election candidates and one of the extremists will win. That's the basic idea. Uh, and so the new system is that everybody's gonna run together. And so that creates incentives for moderation. So because it kind of makes more sense, there's people in the middle who are being left out who you could appeal to. Um, and so what uh, that was the explicit. So that system has also been adopted in Washington state. So along with Eric McGee uh, and uh, uh, we wrote a paper about uh, top two top two primaries. And what we're finding <clears throat> is that the moderation. So it's it, it theoretically it seems to make sense. That does it work in, in practice? So in practice already there's a problem because the, the turnout for the primaries is just very low. For this system to work, you need to have a larger turnout because of the disaffected middle. The worry is that even in a system like this, that people who are motivated to turn out, especially for a more complicated system, are again the zealots. Uh, and so we're not getting a big change. And, and of course, there's also worries about uh, weird things like lockouts when the party, because they split their vote amongst many candidates, may not be represented. So it's a majority Democratic district. They may not have any, any Democrats running the general election. It didn't turn out this way. It's only happened one time, but it's a worry. Um, so the evidence appears to say that it worked, but only for California Democrats, but not for California Republicans, not for Washington Democrats or Republicans, and not for Congress. So that's a little bit kind of a weak evidence. Um, it's still perhaps relatively early, and maybe candidates uh, are not fully adapted to the system. So what the system should be doing is incentivizing moderate politicians. Um, and we don't see them just yet. And we're not exactly sure why that is. Is that because they correctly anticipate that nobody's going to come, come out and support them, even though theoretically they should? Uh, we're not 100% sure. But that's uh, the, the reform that people are, uh, uh, reformers have been talking about, talking up. Now, what it has done, though, is increase competition. That it has been successful at, and that's a separate thing that you may be, that you may like to have. Um, uh, so, in a majority Democratic district, you know the, the fall election is a, as an afterthought, and now we have an election between a more establishment Democrat and a more liberal Democrat. Uh, it's going to be a more competitive right. election. Uh, so that that may be something that's important. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's interesting too to think about the if there is kind of this push toward. The middle with these, you know, top two primaries, yeah. but public opinion is becoming more polarized. Yeah. How do those two things yep. kind of jive together, if, if at all? Well, the, the 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 problem is that one of the things that leads people to turn out at the polls, especially at the primary stage, is strength of like ideological feeling. You know, like it's a there's just very few raging moderates out there, um, and uh, so you know that's that. That's the, that's that's a, that's a, a real eternal problem for these kind of systems. Yeah. So I think uh, overall we know that there are like big macro movements in public opinion, and these macro movements typically are thermostatic in the sense that uh, there's a Republican president for a long time, typically, or a, tr a Republican Congress. Typically, people start turning away from whoever's in power, and this and ideologically sort of drifting a little bit to the other side. Uh, you saw that with Obama. Saw, but uh, overall, I think the big picture is that uh, the uh, 
public opinion is more moderate than than uh, elite opinion, other than activists or politicians. The public is in the middle, and it's much more unimodal, which means one big hump, moderate hump in the middle, and there and the and the politicians and the activists are in the extremes. Um, and so the 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 thing is though that a lot of people are in the middle uh, may not turn out to vote, may not follow political news. Uh, they're sort of a lot of people just are sort of out of the political conversation. The people who are hobbyists, the people who are fo- are amateur politicos following the news, are much more apt to be extreme. Um, and as soon as you start reading. You know, watching MSNBC or watching Fox News or reading the blogs, oh, you're probably an extremist. Um, you're probably not a not a centrist. Uh, but you don't follow political news. Well, you're probably a centrist. Right. And so the the other thing that kind of is tangled up in all this is gerrymandering. Yeah. Right. And so here in in Pennsylvania, we got a new map a couple of, of months ago. There's some cases before the Supreme Court. Right. What 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 effect does does gerrymandering have on on, on polarization or, or vice versa? I suppose. How are those? Well, the I mean, the the big picture, uh, I think, from from political science research is that gerrymandering probably has less influence on polarization than people expect. And the biggest evidence we have for that is the uh, the U.S. Senate. Right. So people so senators are elected statewide. You can't gerrymander states, although they were created in the in the mid 1800s or whatever to be in a kind of a political way. But anyway, but these days the state boundaries are fixed. You can't change them. But senators are becoming more polarized over time uh, and pretty much in a way that almost exactly mirrors uh, U.S. House polarization. So that's our first data point that says, well, well, something else must be going on. Now, and the other aspect of, of gerrymandering is actually, the, the correct strategy in gerrymandering is create, if you're the majority party, is to create a series of like 60-40 districts. Now, 60 you do 60-40 because you want to spread your supporters around as much as possible and bottle up the opponents. So it's possible that it it polarizes your, the minority party. But the majority party should be moderated to the extent of like you can't go all out hog wild crazy because you're not creating a 90-10 district. You're creating a 60-40 district. So there's always a danger. that you, So even in the logic of, you know, it's not creating a 100% uh, that's kind of extremist. Uh, extremist pull. Uh, so I I think overall, you know, there's some concern that uh, we, we can be opposed to gerrymandering for other reasons because it's just, you know, s- smells bad when politicians, you know, choose their voters instead of the other way around. But um, I don't think polarization is the chief concern of the, the problem with, with uh, gerrymandering. Right. Um, and so what what is the the path forward here in terms of thinking about it from like a, a, a laboratories of democracy perspective right how can states I- ensure that you know the, the people who are in office are truly representative of the you know people living there right i think the issue is that um we don't fully understand uh what are the all the causes of polarization and some of them are things like inequality increasing inequality which is another paper i've been working on that uh we have, may have relatively little control over. And so uh, there's polarization and then there's gridlock, okay? And then one leads to the other. And and maybe about polarization, we're upset that the society is pulling apart and getting angry at each other and so forth. But maybe, but at the lawmaking or policymaking aspect is that's the, the part we are concerned about is gridlock. So the thing that creates gridlock are institutions uh, like supermajority requirements that make it uh, that weaponize sort of polarization, right? So a small ideological extreme groups can stop the whole proceedings and hold hostage the policy making process. So maybe the alternative is that we can't maybe do anything about the causes, but we can do something about the effects. Um, and so maybe we take away some of those supermajority uh, institutions. Uh, and allow sort of the, you know, when you say let democracy work, you know, one way of understanding that is elections of consequences, let the majority party do what they will, uh, which is which is great if you're in the majority party, not so great if you're in the minority party. I mean, that's, and that's, that comes back to like, you know, federalism and are we, are we okay with different states making different choices? Uh, and, 
it always, you know, unfortunately, people are hypocrites, and they're, you know, they're they're all cool with, you know, with federalism when they're in the majority, and they're totally not cool with it when they're in the minority, and that's where the federal government has to step in and change things, and and so people rarely have, you know, kind of pure feelings about uh, institutions like federalism, apart from the things that they care about. Therefore, whatever system leads to whatever result they want. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, figuring out where that common ground is among right. everybody is like the ultimate challenge, right? Of course. right? Yeah. Um, great. And so I think the other thing that you've been looking at um, more recently are, are party switchers, right? Yeah. So people who've kind of gone from one party to the other. Right. What what circumstances lead to to that happening? Right. So party switchers are interesting because. Um, it's kind of a dangerous move to switch parties. Uh, you just make lots and lots of enemies. Uh, and every story that you read about party switchers, uh, the party switcher says something like, well, my old party was a big tent, and and then they changed, and, and I could no longer recognize them, so I'm going to switch party. And then, the, then they interview somebody from their old party. It's like, we're going to get you. <laughs> so it's a really dangerous, risky maneuver. But... I think what it uh, what it points out to is kind of the importance of of ideology. So it's, you know, as I said, it used to be that the parties were much more internally varied into who they contained. Obviously, when you have two parties, you have these are going to be big tent parties. But polarization means the parties are becoming more ideological, and what they're saying is right. They're sort of become out of step ideologically with their old parties. So liberal Republicans are more likely to switch. Conservative Democrats are more likely to switch. Um, and if they're out of step with their district also, you know, over time, districts change and people have been there for a long, for a long time. They are sort of out of step with their districts, ideologically out of step, they're too conservative or they're too liberal. And that's sort of the biggest thing. And that, that's so the party switching process is part of the process of how the parties are sorting out. Right. So the, now the Republican Party is the conservative party and the Democratic Party is the liberal party. That wasn't always the case. Right. Uh, one way that's been going on is. People just retire or leave and don't run again. And then a new crop of, or the people are primaried. But this is another way that this is happening. Another way this happening is um, I'm going to switch my party affiliation. And that's going to, and, and in my old party, they were forcing me to vote on things in a way I disagreed with. But now I can be my true self or something like that. Um, and so that that's kind of a, to me, that this is an example of how important ideology is, kind of trumping party um, and uh, you know, people are willing to take this drastic step, which is pot potentially very politically dangerous because they don't like what the old party was making them do. Sure. There's, there's been some talk in kind of the, the pundit class, you post Donald Trump that maybe we need to or should or might just blow up the entire parties as, as they exist now and something completely different will will kind of emerge from that do you do you have thoughts on that about so you know, you know i'm like? always i'm always like super skeptical of these like we gotta you know we gotta blow everything up kind of things i mean that's i know pundits have a lot of space to fill and a lot of air to fill so <laughs> uh and and there's there's an incentive for being more uh, seeming more radical or whatever but to my mind um what I'm interested, I mean, we have two, there's a, there's a reason we have two parties. It's our electoral system is, everything is set up uh, to, to do two parties. So um, I, I'm, I'm really suspicious that a third party can, can emerge. But what I'm more interested in is our, you know, internal change within the parties. Uh, that's typically how we get change. And, and so the obvious question is, you know, is the Republican Party gonna, go, going to transform into a more Trumpist direction? Um, and I think the jury's still out on that. A lot of you know, politicians who have been running explicitly as Trumpists at the state and local levels have not been doing that great. Um, and a lot, you know, like the, what are the Trump, it's hard to tell, of course, with Trump because he's weird and all over the place, but it's who, you know, what are his big issues like trade, um, immigration, although immigration was a conservative concern before, but, um, but you just don't see a wholesale kind of abandonment of um, and a suspicion, some maybe of of, of traditional positions like um, um, government you know, institutions. It, well, yeah, like uh, well, you know, there's always a, within the Republican Party suspicious of, of elite government. But but um, you know, Trump when he was campaigning would say things that would occasionally sound you know progressive. You know, like my preferred healthcare system is the Scottish 
healthcare system. Uh, I think what he meant was the national healthcare system. But uh, he, the 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 parties at the state level and in Congress have basically been doing what they would have been doing had it not been for him. So I don't see evidence so far that the Republican Party uh, after Donald Trump is going to move into significantly different directions. Uh, with Bernie Sanders, that's the other side of the coin. Um, there, I do see a move, but uh, in a more progressive direction. And you can see that by the, the presidential candidates or the, the presumed presidential candidates for 2020. You know, they're all tweeting support for Medicare for all and single payer. Um, whereas, you know, if you think back to uh, think back to, to 2016, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton says, well, that's, you know, sounds good in theory, but uh, practically we can't, we can't do it um, or something like that. So um, the, the party is moving leftward. And, uh, and I don't know if that's so much Bernie Sanders. I think it's just the party's moving le- leftward. And Bernie Sanders was a, was a product of that rather than the cause of that. Sure. Um, and so that to me, so I, yeah, I'll buy that the parties are moving leftward in the Democratic Party case and rightward in the Republican Party case. But are, are they moving in the Trumpist way off the axis and doing something totally different? I don't see evidence for that yet. Perfect. Well, that is a great place to leave things. Yeah. So, Boris, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So some very interesting um, uh commentary on on the idea of polarization within states and i think that's really uh something that that when you think about polarization you think about congress right and you think about gridlock and whatnot but um but his argument that um that you know states are a different and perhaps even more positive manifestation of uh of polarization is pretty interesting yes it is i mean one thing that uh one uh one reason people study the states beyond the fact that they're just important in the federal system, at one time they were the most important part of the federal system, arguably, is that they, um, you know, they operate as, uh, they allow us to make comparisons. And for example, to see what happens when you have a more polarized system in one state versus a less polarized mm-hmm. system or another. Right. Part of what Boris was saying is that when you have uh, political systems with, uh, unified control of government, uh, then things happen. But with polarized parties, when you have systems of divided government where one controls one branch and one the other, and their inability to compromise with one another, then you tend to get this kind of nothing happens. Now, Now, I also think there's something else to polarization that hasn't really come up here, and that is that polarization, I think, is helping to erode trust over time. And, and it's this conflict, this constant conflict that I think has led to many people kind of tuning out politics, becoming distrustful of political institutions. And so while there's a lot of reasons that trust is eroded in this country towards institutions, and it truly has, it, it also can't be lost that it, it, it parallels polarization of the party system. Mm-hmm. And I've seen some interesting work that if you look at states that have much more polarized party systems, you have much less trust. Well, I think I, I mean I guess that is kind of my argument that mm-hmm. that po- you can't look at this polarization outside the context of the other things that we've been talking about and and it it you know it is a very Madisonian point to say that um, conflict if is inevitable but it is only productive if it's managed and kept within um, some bounds of behavior. Yeah. And I think we are now um, at minimum pushing against those if we haven't eliminated some of them. And actually, that, that's a, you know, so I, I think all this emphasis, by the way, on conflict and, and not being able to get along actually hides a lot of what does go on in government institutions, which is a lot of work does get done. Yes. And... Uh, and, and below the below the surface, below the scenes, within committees, uh, you know, within uh, on on uh, on lower profile issues and legislation, you do actually see cooperation. You do see the bringing in of facts and evidence. You do see trying to reach a solution that's mm-hmm. acceptable uh, to both sides. I, I think much of it is lost in. Uh, the more high high profile issues, and we're not seeing that in many of the states. I guess, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, all I would say is that um, 
as a society, we and and certainly among uh, political uh, leaders, et, et cetera, we need to think about how we manage conflict. And it uh, because it's it's just human nature to be tribal. It's human nature to see the other as uh, a threat. And um, we have um, designed our institutions around norms and things like that to um, to curtail that natural human inclination. And I think we're giving vent to it more now than we yes, have. Yes, we're going to have to figure out how to do that within the context of polarized parties because right. they're not going away. They're not going away. And and so there is it, there is still the way in which this laboratory of democracy metaphor holds. Um, I think that's an interesting point. And, but and we're going to save that for another podcast. No, I get it. No, but I'm, no. Just, I'm just saying that you, your, your, uh, your argument is that there are, there are still kind of experiments going on that we can evaluate and that are important to how our politics moves forward. Yes, the states are very much experiments in democracy. I want to give a, uh, a thanks to uh, Tina Lacordo, who is uh, kind of a guest intern. Uh, she's a WPSU intern, and she's helping us today. So... Um, so I, I think we brought this ship into the into the port as well as possible. Um, and uh, I want to uh, thank you all for listening. I'm Chris Beam. I'm Michael Berkman, and this has been uh, the McCourtney Institute for Democracies. Democracy Works. Democracy Works.